Jesus, once more deeply moved, came to the tomb. It was a cave with a stone laid across the entrance. Take away the stone, he said. But Lord, said Martha, the sister of the dead man, by this time there is a bad odor, for he has been in there four days. Then Jesus said, Did I not tell you that if you believe, you will see the glory of God? So they took away the stone. Then Jesus looked up and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I said this for the benefit of the people standing here, that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said this, Jesus called out in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out, his hands and feet wrapped with strips of linen and a cloth around his face. Jesus said to them, take off the grave clothes and let him go. if you've lived in the Monterey area for any length of time, you might have had somebody from out of town ask you this question. Well, do you ever, like, just bump into him? You know, do you ever just see him around town? I mean, I know years ago he was in local politics, and I hear he still lives there. And when he's not out doing famous guy stuff, I, I, I guess he's in Monterey. Do you ever just, like, you know, bump into Clint? You know, do you ever just bump into Clint? Well, I got a couple of bump into Clint stories for you. Uh, one of my, I had, a cha- I had some buddies coming in from Michigan, and so I asked a friend of mine who's kind of got connections if we could get, get us to play Clint's golf course up here in the hills behind us. And it, they worked it out, so my three buddies from Michigan were getting a chance to play Clint's golf course. It was pretty open, so we're moving along, four of us. But we see this pair of two golfers behind us. They're each in their own cart, and they're buzzing around the course like they own the place. And because... Um, <laughs> He does, and, uh, and so they're kind of coming up on us pretty quickly, so we got to a par three, and there's kind of a polite thing in golf, if you're a slower group, you, on a par three, you hit on the green, then you just go stand to the side, and you wait. So I said to the, one of the guys that hit over the green, he was down looking for his ball, but the two guys that were standing by the green, I just said to him, okay, here's the deal. You know, this is Clint's course, and this is his home, so we just stand over here, smile, but don't run over, don't say, I love your movies, don't do any of that silly stuff, just stand here politely, and just, you know. So we stood over there and waited, and so Clint had made a shot right on the green, about 18 feet for the putt, makes the putt for a birdie, so he's feeling pretty good, and he strides over to us, puts out his hand, shakes his hands, he says, how do you like my course? And um, we said, it's a lovely course, Mr. Eastwood, and then he walked off and had a nice rest of the day. So there was that little encounter. And then uh, we had a past guest pastor here, Wes Dupin, and Wes and Claudia Dupin have a son named Clint. And uh, Claudia named Clint after Clint Eastwood because she's a huge fan. So when she was here, she said, do you think we'll bump in? Do you think we'll see Clint? And I said, probably not. But we were able to take them up to the restaurant that's Clint's restaurant. So we're sitting there for dinner. And who comes in with a group of people to have dinner and sits at the table directly next to us? No, not him. No, no, it was Clint, actually. So uh, you're guessing. Thing. But Clint comes and sits there. So she says, she says oh, I'm going to go and, and like, get a picture with him and send it to my friends. I said, I said, no, you're not. I said, this is his restaurant. It's kind of like his home. You don't just go over and go gaga over him. You just, just leave him alone. She said, but we named our son Clint after him. I got to go tell him we named his son after him. And I said, no, you're not. That's just kind of creepy. And, uh, and so we had a nice we had a little conversation. And she just sat there the whole time, like, looking over, and, but behaving herself. Um, you, know, you think, I never know what it feels like to be that kind of that person that everybody's like, is that the guy? Is she the one? But Lazarus was. You just heard a passage of the resurrection of Lazarus. And we're going to study this passage today. And we're going to talk about what it means to understand the resurrection of Jesus impacts us just, not just at the end of our lives, but now. But think about Lazarus. He was, and, and I, I believe the Bible is actually true, by the way. It's not just nice little stories with moralisms. I believe it's true. Lazarus was dead. And they called for Jesus. They tracked him down. And, and he came four days after he had died and in the tomb for four days. And Jesus spoke the word of life and Lazarus was raised from the dead. And, and Lazarus lived in a little town called Bethany and, and his sister Mary and Martha lived there also. And that was about 1.5 miles from Jerusalem. That's like from here to Tarpey's on 68th Street. I mean, it's right next door. Do you think when Lazarus went shopping at the, you know, at the market in Jerusalem, anybody was like, oh, is that, is that the guy? Is that the guy that was the dead guy? Who the other guy who died, Jesus, and rose, spoke to this dead guy and brought him, is that the, I mean, you'd be pretty famous in Bethany and Jerusalem if you were dead for four days and raised to life. You know, for the rest of his life, everywhere Lazarus went, people were like, that's the guy that was dead who's now alive. And what would that have been like to be that guy? 
Well, here's the reality we're gonna think about today. If you've come to faith in Jesus Christ, if you've come to the cross and confessed your sins and received the grace of Jesus and his resurrection power is in you, you are that guy. You are that woman. You've been transformed by the resurrection power of Jesus Christ and been raised again to new life through Jesus Christ. If you have your Bibles, look with me at John chapter 11. In John 11, this is the story of Lazarus and his resurrection. And like I said before, Lazarus, he'd become very ill. His sisters called for Jesus, hoping that Jesus could heal him, but Jesus lingered. He didn't make it back in time, and Lazarus died. They put him in the tomb. One day went by, two days, three days, four days went by, and Jesus finally shows up. And this is, this is part of that encounter, beginning in verse 40, in, in John chapter 11, we read this. Then Jesus said, did I not tell you that if you believe, you will see the glory of God? So they took away the stone, the stone that was blocking the tomb of Lazarus. They took away the stone. Then Jesus looked up and said, here's his prayer. Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me. But I said this for the benefit of those people standing here, that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said this, Jesus called out in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out, his hands and feet wrapped with strips of linen and a cloth around his face. The dead man was alive again. And that's the story of every person who puts their faith in Jesus. You see, God looks at this world, and he sees only two kinds of people. Uh, our world has become so intersectional and so conflicted. In the last couple of years, it's mind-boggling, the level of conflict people are having over differences. But when God looks at us, he only sees two things. Those people who have already received his grace through Jesus and are raised again and walking in the resurrection power right now and have heaven as their home, and those people that he wants to one day know Jesus and come to receive his grace. That's how God sees people. Those that are part of his family and those that aren't, but he wants to be part of their family. And so we're gonna talk today about what it means to walk in the resurrection power of Jesus Christ. What happened at that, at that moment when Jesus called Lazarus out was the miraculous act we're gonna look at today. This is the fifth of the miraculous acts we're looking at in this series. Jesus spoke and Lazarus came from death to life. He, he came from death to life. He came back and walked among us and lived the rest of his life with people saying, that's the guy. That's the guy that was dead, and now he's alive. And the same is true of us if we put our faith in Jesus Christ. We are transformed. Romans chapter six says this. The apostle Paul is writing, and he says this. Or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? There's that picture that we're gonna experience this Wednesday night with a bunch of students and a bunch of adults. You know, you're buried in baptism. You go into the water, baptized into his death, and we are therefore buried with him through baptism. That's the picture of going under the water in death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. We may live a new life. Not just eternal life someday. That's guaranteed if you put your faith in Jesus, but a new life now. And I think some Christians miss this. Some Christians think this is the Christian faith. I put my faith in Jesus, and I say yes to say a certain prayer, and then one day when I die, I'll go to heaven. And everything in between is just kind of, uh, it's my life. No, when you put your faith in Jesus, you're raised to new life now, and the resurrection power of Jesus is unleashed in you. Someone say amen. I mean, this is the truth. We should be radically changed people. As a matter of fact, this morning, after the last service, I, I sat here and prayed with them. five different people came, five group people or couples or families came up for prayer. The very last one was waiting. And she actually said to me this morning, she said, I want you to know I prayed to receive Jesus in this church five years ago. I became a Christian. She said, everything you said in the sermon today is true in my life. She said, I am completely a different person. She said, when I came here to Shoreline that day, she said, I was a drug addict, a drug dealer, and living a radical sexual, um, a <coughs> an alternative sexual lifestyle. She said, none of that is true of me anymore. She said, everything's changed. And she just wanted to pray and celebrate that. Isn't that great? And, and there's... there's but the, for everyone who's come to the cross and received Jesus, that should be our story. We're changed. We're no longer the same people. So here's, here's the miraculous message. Jesus is the resurrection and the life. His life and the power of his eternal hope is unleashed in us now, today, and every moment of our life. Do you believe that? It's true. 
We can walk in the victory, power, hope, joy, and his grace even now. We don't need to wait until we die to live in the power of the resurrection. It is here now. That's what Jesus taught. Listen to these words again from John chapter 11, verse 21. Lord Martha, the sister of Lazarus, Lord Martha said to Jesus, if you had been here, this is before he raised Lazarus, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But I know that even now God will give you whatever you ask. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. And Martha answered, well, I know he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. But Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? Do you believe that through faith in Jesus Christ, the unleashing of the resurrection power of Jesus Christ is in your life now? Do you believe that? You should. And if you choose, if you're not a Christian and you choose to put your faith in Jesus, it's not just like you're punching a a, a ticket for the train to heaven someday. You're saying, Jesus, I'm going to walk in the power and the glory of your resurrection every moment of every day for the rest of my life. And so so I want to think about this massive challenge. And this is the challenge to walk in the power of the resurrection that some of us, I think, miss. And certainly all of us, some days we miss it, but some of us have not thought about this any way at all. We think, well, I became a Christian. I'll go to heaven someday. and And I spend an hour in church on Sundays. No, no, it's every moment of every day. Here's the challenge, a massive challenge. How will I live in victory over sin and temptation now, today in my life? How will I walk in power to do God's will every day? How will I declare the good news that the power and glory of God can be yours today? How do I tell other people the same glory of Jesus, the same power can be yours? In the book of Acts, after the Holy Spirit came on the church, we read these words in Acts 4.32. All the believers were one in heart and one in mind. No one claimed that any of their possessions was their own, but they shared everything they had, this graciousness. With great power, the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And God's grace was so powerfully at work in them all. They were changed. Not just going to heaven someday. That's true, praise the Lord. But they were changed today and forever. And so I want to share with you a vision of the resurrection life. And if you're a note taker, there's a place in your, in your outline there in your bulletin to write some of these down, or you can just lock them in your heart. What does it look like when we live a resurrected life in Jesus Christ now? And here's one of the things, one of the differences it makes. It is a life of power for every day. There's a filling of power that we can actually live for God and follow him and walk in his ways. We have power, where we were powerless before, In the resurrection of Christ and his power in us by his Holy Spirit, we can live for Jesus today. Does anybody believe that? We can. We can live radically different lives. In John 15, there's this amazing chapter in John 15 about how Jesus is the vine and we're the branches. And when we're connected in him, when we're engrafted into him, we draw life when we abide, when we remain in him. And here's what Jesus says in John 15, verse 9. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Now remain, abide, stay in my love. If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commands and remain in his love. Jesus says, you can have the power to walk in my commands, to follow my ways, to live a different kind of life. And sometimes we feel like we can't. There's so many temptations in the world and the way the world thinks and does things, we just kind of get sucked and swept into it. Well, everyone does it. That's the way of the culture. I've got to live that way. Not true. We follow the ways of Jesus and the commands of God. And when that happens, God transforms us. We live in a different way. We become different people than we were before. How much has your life transformed since you've come to know Jesus? Is your attitude, well, I was pretty good before and I'm I'm a little better now? Or is it, man, I've been transformed by the power of Jesus? I'm going to share a few stories today with each of these you know, transformations of the resurrection power in us. I'm going to share a few stories, uh, uh, ancient historical stories and modern ones as well. But here's one story for you. Sherry and I, when our first son was born, were protective of him, watching over him. But I remember the first time, as a, as a parent with your firstborn child, you probably remember the first time you took your child and handed them over to somebody else to take care of them. Sherry's family was in Michigan. We lived in California. My family wasn't available. So we handed our child over to this couple. The husband in the couple um, was a uh, bodyguard for a drug dealer. 
And not at that moment, but he had been. Uh, when he got out of Vietnam, he said, I wanted a job where I could do the things I love the most. So I got a job as a bodyguard for a drug, drug dealer. He wouldn't talk about it much, but I became very close to him and kind of, kind of tell some of the story. He was all about how Jesus had changed him, not who he was before, but in the right moment, he would share who he was before. Who he was was a, drug, was, was a bodyguard for a drug dealer. He said, he, said, when I, he said, I did that because of the four things I loved, I had access to. I loved drugs, I loved women, I loved money, and I loved violence. And I got all those through my job. That was Walt. And I put my firstborn child into his arms because when I met Walt, he had met Jesus. And he wasn't those things anymore. He, he was one of the most kind. He was actually the chairman of our deacons. He handled the church's money. That guy? That guy? What's the answer? Yes, because he's not that guy anymore. Generous, loving, gentle, tender. He said to me, I don't, even, he said, I don't even swear anymore. He said, I know all the words, but he said, I don't even like to say them anymore. Transformed by the power of Jesus. Because that's what Jesus does. His power is unleashed in us. A vision of the resurrection life. What does it look like? Here's the second thing. It's the life where joy is unstoppable. Where you have joy. And again, in John chapter 15, verse 11, Jesus says, I have told you this so that you, so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. Absolutely full. Jesus says, I, I will bring fullness of joy to you. That's what Christ does when we walk and live in his resurrection power. So we walk in joy in the daily little stuff of life. We notice the little things of life. We say, Lord, thank you for another day that I can breathe. For another day to live for you. Lord, I thank you for another Sunday where I can go to Shoreline Church and give worship to you and be with God's people. I thank, I thank you for the little things, but also I'm thankful when things don't go my way. I can be joyful when I don't get my way. Can you say that? Can you say, I can be joyful? Or what about, can I be joyful when things go the opposite of my way? Or does that crush your joy? I'll tell you another story. A woman named Lucille. Lucille mentors my wife, Sherry. She's been mentoring Sherry for over 30 years. Lucille is older than Sherry's mom. And over those 30 years that we've walked with Lucille, we, we walked with Lucille as she lost her daughter. And then tragically lost her, that daughter's daughter. And then she lost her husband. And you know, Lucille mourned and sorrowed and walked through all those things. But in all of it, there was this undergirding, this, 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 this sort of foundation of a joy of Jesus Christ through the tears and through the sorrows and, and at times the joy of Jesus Christ and the, just the goodness of him. And, and there's, I don't know if I know almost anyone who walks on this planet that's more joyful than Lucille Patmos. When, when I get a birthday card or a Christmas card from her, it just, it just exudes the joy. When I see her, she's just... The resurrection power of Jesus and the joy of Jesus flows through her, through all of her sorrow, through all of her losses, there's a depth of joy. Do you know you can live in that joy? Jesus says you can. And in the power of his resurrection, that's ours. A vision of, vision of the resurrection life. Here's the third thing. It's a life of intimacy with Jesus. We stay connected to him. He becomes our closest friend. Yes, our Lord. Yes, our Savior, but our friend. In John 15, 15, we read this. I no longer call you servants, Jesus says, because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends. For everything that I have learned from my Father, I have made known to you. Jesus says, I let you know what's going on. I want to be as close to you as a cl your closest friend. As a matter of fact, I think Jesus wants to be closer to us than our closest friend. And when he's our closest friend, everything else is a bonus. And so do you walk with Jesus in friendship, in your home, just in the flow of life? Do you walk with Jesus as your friend at school or at work, j j just as you are going about the business of your day? Do you walk with Jesus as your friend on Friday night and Saturday when you say, I, I got my time, I got my thing, and, or, or do, you, do you say, Jesus, I walk with you as my closest friend, or do you do this? Okay, Jesus, it's Friday night. I'm going out with some friends tonight, so I just want you to wait home here. Jesus, you just wait here. I'll be back in a few hours. Um, you don't, trust me, Jesus, you don't want to come along for this evening. I'll, I'll repent later, right? Um, do, you, do you have this feeling that you know, Jesus is for part of your life, or is he your friend in all that you do? What Jesus is saying, saying, listen, I call you friend. 
He's with you. Do you walk in, in, in the resurrection? Because Christ is risen, because he's present, because he sent his spirit to be with us, we can walk in his presence every moment of every day. That's life changing. I love the story of Brother Lawrence. And if you want to learn his story, just go online and download the book, Practicing the Presence of God, or buy a copy. Of, it's, it's about this thick. You can listen to it on, as an audio book in probably less than an hour. Just a little teeny book. Brother Lawrence was a brother in a, in a group of monks. And, these, and he, he had a specific job. He wasn't a monk. He was just a brother. It's kind of like below the monk sort of thing in the ancient world. And uh, his job was washing the dishes and preparing food. And he would spend eight, nine, ten hours every day washing dishes and preparing food, day after day after day after day. And this little book, Practicing the Presence of God, he basically says, I made it my business to experience the presence of Jesus with every dish I washed and every dish I dried, with every breath I breathed. He said, I just tried to learn how to experience the presence of God in everything I do. And this book is so simple and so beautiful and so powerful. He knew that tomorrow he'd be washing dishes for eight to 10 hours. And with every dish, he met with Jesus. And I think in some ways, he probably had a richer life in those moments washing dishes that we have in our kind of adventure folk. I gotta have this adventure and that and experience after experience. And he says, yeah, here's my experience. I meet with Jesus with everything I do. And it's transformational. We can walk in that kind of intimacy with God. We should walk in that kind of intimacy with God. A vision of the resurrection life. It's a life that unleashes love. It's, it's, it's a, a life that frees us to love those that we are close to us, that we care about, and to love those who maybe we don't know so well, and to love those even sometimes who hate us. Christians can walk in love because of the resurrection power of Jesus. In John chapter 15, continuing on in that passage, verse 12 says this. Jesus says, my command is this. Love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. He says, this is my command, love each other as I have loved you. He says, here's the model of love, the way Jesus loved you. Man, that's a lot of love. That's love that I don't have power to express, but he has power to express through me. So here's the question, do you love God's people? Do you love other Christians? Do you pray for Shoreline? When you're here at church, do you welcome people and greet people? Do you extend love to God's people? Do you, when you're driving around the community and you see other churches, do you pray for churches that are Bible-believing Christian churches and say, God, bless them and fill them? I love the prayer today, praying, you know, praying for Cypress Church and Pastor Ben Sobels. Pastor Ben Sobels is my next-door neighbor, a dear friend, and we've been in a pastor's group together for six or seven years now. I love him. I love that church because, because Jesus lives in me. I don't see other churches as competition. They're the family of God. We love them. Do I, do I love the people I encounter throughout my day? Those that know Jesus and those that don't. Of all people, those who should overflow with love are God's people. I shared the last two weeks about, about Sri Lanka. I'm particularly connected there because we have partnership with ministries there and also because a, a dear friend of mine, Ajith Fernando, has been a pastor there for all of his adult life. And, he, and Ajith pastors among, mostly works with students and drug addicts. And he travels the world and speaks, and people keep saying to him, Ajith, why do you still live in Sri Lanka? Why don't you come and live somewhere safer? Come to the States, come somewhere in Europe. And he gets offered these teaching posts and opportunities. He said, that's my home, and those are my people. I was born there, I minister there, I'll die there. But until 10 years ago, that country was in civil war. And I watched for 20 years, watched Ajith pray and love people who were being hate-filled and antagonistic and showed the presence of Jesus. He wrote an article uh, that we're going to put a link to it on our website here, on, on the pa front page of our website tomorrow. Um, he wrote an article, six responses to the Easter terror attacks in Sri Lanka. All right, what are six ways that Christians should respond? It's one of the most mature, godly, loving responses I could imagine. He sent a, he sent a link to me, and I want to share that with all of you. And so if you go on the website tomorrow, you can read that. But, but this sense of, he, he's had some of his people on his ministry team locked up in jail and persecuted just because they're Christians. And he just keeps relentlessly loving people in the name of Jesus. How do you do that? In the power of the resurrection. And then one more vision for the resurrection life. To walk in that resurrection power. Number five. A life where forgiveness is possible. Where we're able to forgive others. And this is one of those topics that when I bring it up, when I preach on this, I get people that get bristly and push back and they're saying, you, know, you don't know what that person did. You don't know what I went through. I know Jesus says forgive, but I got a special exemption just for me. Because if you knew, you'd know why I don't have to forgive, why I shouldn't forgive. 
But listen to the words of Jesus in Matthew 6, 12. Jesus says, he's teaching us to pray. He says, for my disciples, when you pray, pray this, and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. Really? You want to pray that? Jesus, here's my prayer. I want you to forgive me the way that I forgive those who've wronged me. Does anybody want to pray that prayer honestly? You want Jesus to forgive you just like you forgive others? I don't think any of us want that. It's hard to forgive, but in the resurrection power of Jesus, it's possible. And we need to walk in that. In Ephesians 4, 32, the apostle Paul writes these words. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ, God forgave you. Just as in Christ, God forgave you. Here's what, here's what the Apostle Paul is saying. The way that we forgive is just like God forgave us through Jesus Christ. Undeserved, absolute grace. And it's hard for us to comprehend that kind of forgiveness. But when we forgive, it reveals the presence of Jesus. We show that Jesus is present when we forgive. When we forgive, we declare our theology. A resurrection, Jesus forgiving theology. If we believe that he rose, if we believe he forgave us for our sins, how can we not forgive others? But forgiveness is difficult. It's incredibly difficult and challenging. And the last story I want to share with you is a story of Corey Tenboom. For some of you, <coughs> for some of you, you know that name, you've heard that name. For others, ones of you, you say, Corey, Ten Corey Tenboom, I don't know who that is. Corey Ten Boom was a prisoner of war in, in, in the Ravensbrück, uh, Ravensbrück concentration camp under the Nazis, she and her sister. While she was there, her sister died. She made it through and she lived. And when she got out of there, she spent the next 30 years of her life traveling the world and talking about forgiveness. If anybody would have a hard time forgiving, it would be somebody who had been in a Nazi concentration camp and watched their sister die. But she knew Jesus and she knew the power of the resurrection. She'd encountered the risen Lord. And she was seeking to live out what Jesus called her to live as hard as it was. And there's a story that's recorded in, in a book uh, written by Eric Metaxas about seven women of faith. But listen to these words. After the war and freedom from the concentration camp, Corey traveled and told people her story of God's forgiveness of sins and of the need for people to forgive those who had harmed them. Corey herself was put to the test in 1947 while speaking at a church in Munich. She was speaking at a church in Munich. At the close of the service, a balding man in a gray overcoat stepped forward to meet her. Corey froze. She knew this man well. He'd been one of the most vicious guards at Ravensbrück, one who had mocked the women prisoners as they showered. It came back with a rush, she wrote. The huge room with its harsh overhead lights, the pathetic pile of dresses and shoes in the center of the floor, and the shame of walking naked past this man. And now he was pushing his hand out to shake hers and saying, fine message, Fraulein, how good it is to know that as you say, all our sins are at the bottom of the sea. And she writes, and I, who had spoken so glibly of forgiveness, fumbled for my pocketbook rather than take his hand. He would not remember me, of course. How could he remember one prisoner among thousands of women? But I remembered him. The leather crop swinging from his belt. I was face to face with one of my captors and my blood seemed to freeze. He said, you mentioned Ravensbrook in your talk. I was a guard there, but since that time, he went on, I have become a Christian. I know that God has forgiven me for the cruel things I did there, but I would like to hear it from your lips as well, Fraulein. Again, the hand came out. Will you forgive me? I stood there. I whose sins had again and again to be forgiven, and I could not forgive. My sister Betsy had died in that place. Could he erase her slow, terrible death simply for the asking? The soldier stood there expectantly, waiting for Corey to shake his hand. She wrestled with the most difficult thing, she wrote, I have ever had to do, for I had to do it. I knew that. The message that God forgives has a prior condition, that we forgive those who have injured us. Standing there before the former SS man, Corey remembered that forgiveness is an act of the will, not an emotion. 
Jesus, help me, she prayed. I can lift my hand. I can do that much. You supply the feeling. Corey thrust out her hand. And she writes, and as I did, an incredible thing took place. The current started in my shoulder and raced down my arm and sprang into our joined hands. And then the healing warmth seemed to flood my whole being, bringing tears to my eyes. I forgive you, brother, I cried with all my heart. For a long moment, we grasped each other's hands, the former guard and the former prisoner. I had never known God's love so intensely as I did in that moment. But even so, I realized it was not my love. I had tried, and I did not have the power. It was the power of the Holy Spirit. That's the power of the resurrection of Jesus Christ and the presence of the Spirit of God in us. When we can't love, he loves through us. When we can't forgive, he forgives through us. When we have no power, he brings power for us. And the world should look at those who've come to the cross and received Jesus and say, isn't she the one whose life has been turned upside down and changed because she met Jesus? Isn't Isn't that the guy? He he was so different before. Man, he loves, he forgives, he cares, he gives, he's different. The world should look at us and say, that's the one who's been transformed. Because Christ is risen and he is in us. And if you know Jesus, that should be our story. And if you don't, it can be your story through the power of Jesus. Oh, risen Lord Jesus Christ. We pray that those of us who have come to the cross and confessed our sins and our wrongs and been lavished with your grace and covered by your forgiveness and made new and empowered by the Holy Spirit, that we would live different lives, that we would be so different that people would notice, that day by day we would be transformed by the power of the risen Jesus Christ. Jesus, let us not just sit around and wait for heaven. But let us live in the resurrection power of Jesus every moment of every day for your glory, O God, we pray. Do this in us and let the world know that you are alive and you are alive in us. We pray this for the sake and in the name of Jesus. Amen.